Welcome everyone to our digital worship service. We are glad that you are taking time to join us in worshiping our risen Savior. If this is your first time, we just want to say welcome. And if this is not your first time, well, welcome back. We're glad that you're back. Uh, my name is Rob Keparudis, and I am one of the pastors at Terra Nova Church in Troy, New York. If you are new to our virtual service, well, here's what you can expect during this time together. We'll worship with uh, two songs. Then Whitney will come and read the scripture on a video today for us. We'll then hear from Pastor Ed as he preaches the word from Matthew. And then we'll take some time to celebrate communion, which probably means you should pause this video and gather those things that you will need to celebrate. Then we'll close our time with two more worship songs, followed by some announcements and a benediction to send us out. Wherever you are at in life today, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, whether you're burdened or you're rejoicing, maybe you're exhausted and you feel alone, hear this truth today. God wants you to know who he is and what he has done for you. The goal of studying the Bible isn't just to know more, it's to know God. Through his word, he's revealed himself and he's invited us into a relationship with him. His word speaks to us today and reminds us, in spite of the distancing, God is near. And in spite of the hardships that surround us, God is good, that he is faithful, and that his love endures forever. Hear and respond to the word of the Lord with me. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. How great thou art, 
Scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 23 through chapter 9, verse 8. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gardenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of pigs was feeding in some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into that herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came into his own city. And behold, some men brought him to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then says to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. It's one thing to look out your window on a beautiful, clear spring day and enjoy it and to see the beauty of the sunlight on the green grass, to, to see gardens and flowers and plants blooming and growing again, to see some signs of life, to hear, to hear the birds and to see animals running about. But it also doesn't take very long, nor does it take a particularly gifted cynic to look at the world and say, it, it's broken. There's brokenness at every level of government in every country that I've ever seen or looked at. There's brokenness both now and historically in the way people deal and have dealt with one another. There's brokenness in the world around us, the, the pollution that we've, we've brought into our own water tables. Some days it seems as though we have nothing but despair, added brokenness, and we wonder who can possibly fix this. Jesus shows up in our world, our broken world, and presents himself as the king, who is the ruler over creation, and it is the, the reparation, the redemption of all of our brokenness. Here's the roadmap for today. First, Jesus will address raging nature and the forces around that can threaten us. Then he'll address spiritual forces that abuse and oppress us. And finally, he'll reach right inside a person and address what is sick in their body and in their soul. Let's pray together. Lord, would you please help us today to see this world honestly, ourselves honestly, stripped raw and bare before you? But Lord, help us in all the tragedy we'll see inside our own mind, heart, soul, inside the world around us. Help us to see the triumph of our Christ. God, help us to see your love, your care, your provisions, your plan, and all that you've promised for us in Jesus. 
Grant us faith, Lord, to be able to hear your words and act upon them. We ask these things in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 23 tells us in the passage that the disciples are followers of Jesus. That's the first and primary, most important thing about a disciple. Jesus gets into the boat and it says the disciples followed. They know what they know so far. They know this Jesus who has confounded them from the moment that he met them, who seemed to be able to reveal their hearts and challenge them and inspire them that he is the hope of the scriptures, the promised Messiah of Israel. But there's so much they don't understand yet. That will become evident even by the end of the passage, when they will wonder with a fresh amazement, who is this Jesus? And sometimes following Jesus is like that. There are times when disciples are confused. They don't understand why Jesus is doing one thing and not another, or why he has refrained from doing one thing. It comes up multiple times for those recorded in the scripture who are following Jesus, and honestly, for us. Sometimes there's doubt. Is this really right? Should I really follow him? After his resurrection, it says that the disciples followed him to the place he had called them, and they worshipped, apparently all of them, but some doubted. See, in our, in our finite and mortal frames, in our sinfulness and humanity, it's impossible for us now to fully understand the, the infinite and the perfect. So sometimes we wonder. Sometimes disobedience is part of that disciple's walk. We, we, we see it again and again in the Gospels. It becomes particularly spotlighted in the life of Peter. And yet Jesus is aware and shepherding the entire time. It would be too easy to make us the center of the story and be discouraged over our own doubt, or our own confusion, or our own disobediences. But the headline of the story is this. God understands and is shepherding us the entire time. Our disobedience, our doubt, our confusion never takes away the most important part of the equation. Jesus, like a shepherd, is leading us. See, the sheep don't need to understand everything about the shepherd. The sheep may not even know what the day or hour plan is, but the shepherd is always aware and caring for the sheep. And Jesus has led them here. He's actually incredibly relaxed even in the midst of our dire moments. As a matter of fact, in this passage, the disciples have to wake him when this storm comes upon them. A storm that is enough of a storm to rattle seasoned fishermen. The kind of storm that makes these people fear for their lives. And they awaken Jesus. And in verse 25, when they awake him, they say, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. In a parallel gospel account, they'll say, Lord, we are perishing, don't you care? It becomes that moment of doubt in the midst of need for deliverance. God, if you don't meet what is the crisis of my moment, of my day, you must not be there or you must not care. Let's not forget what Peter writes. Peter will write, Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Jesus, the shepherd, then speaks to the wind and waves. And he tells them, Be muzzled, silence, stop. And with a word, they obey. And this is what brings the amazement. There are things in this world we can change and, and move the needle on. Changing the weather? Not so much one of them. And they ask, what sort of man is this that wind and waves obey him? A new place of revelation, a new space of doubt they'll have to understand and fill with faith over time. More about Jesus as disciples follow him. In the next scene, Jesus is then across the waters in the boat. The, the storm is behind them, and they're met by two demoniacs. Th these men are so dangerous that people hate to pass through the graveyard where they are. Another gospel account will present the demoniac of, of this area as being chained in the graveyard because people are so terrified of him. See, demons work for Satan. Satan is a liar and a murderer. Satan hates God. He is God's enemy. And he hates the image of God. And so what he does is try to destroy that. These demon-possessed people are prone to self-harm, the scriptures will tell us. They'll cut themselves with rocks. And further, they try to destroy other people. That's why the people are so terrified to pass through the graveyards. It is straight-up demonic behavior to hate the image of God. 
It is demonic to want to destroy that image in yourself or in others. We see the demonic pull of this from the fall until today. I'll tell you, I think it's demonic the way that people are able to hate people based on their ethnicity or or their gender or their country of origin. I think when we wade into the streams of hatred of those in the image of God, we will find ourselves in demonic company. Jesus does something interesting, though. He he treats the demoniacs as victims. He, He doesn't chastise them for some behavior, never seems to when he casts out demons, that they're responsible. They're seen like those who are attacked, those who were mugged by a greater force. Remember, these demons are fallen angels, much more power than humanity. Remember, they've been around since the beginning, much more aware and shrewd of how human beings behave. And so Jesus frees these victims with a word. The gratitude of the one is recorded in the other Gospels, where he wants to follow and get in the boat, and Jesus sends him to go speak in the the towns around him. It's probably Decapolis, the 10 cities, um, Gentile areas, that's why they're raising pigs. And the people who now see this great light and great power, who knew these people as terrifying, demonic, possessed people, who are now in their right minds, they, they rush down and send Jesus away. Have you ever been so scared of what God does to change something? the narrative of your life, the, the, the course of things for you, the, the things you have to give away because he doesn't just call you to him, he calls you from other things that, that you want to shut your eyes, stop your ears, and turn away from following. That's the moment that these villagers find themselves in. And terrifyingly to me, Jesus doesn't stop and plead with them and ask them to recognize who he is. He leaves. The villagers who rush down want Jesus gone. There's a scene in the Gospels, another healing at a pool, where people believe that angels stirred the waters and those in right after that could could be healed of afflictions, where Jesus sees a man who's paralyzed, he's disabled, trying to get to the pool. And, And what he finds is the person can't get there, and he asks the person, King James Version, "'Willest thou be well?' There's a place somewhere in all of us where we have to ask if we know Jesus, if we can trust him, if he can guide and heal us, do we really want that? Will we yield or we will say, or will we say, Jesus, go away, give us our space, give us our way? The last narrative. Jesus has now crossed over again. If we're mapping it, it says that he crosses back over to the place where he's from. Look at the passage. And getting into a boat... He crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home, and when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. There's a couple things happening all at once. We know from parallel accounts that this is where friends of a paralyzed man have brought a paralytic to Jesus and worked through the crowds to be able to get him there. Thank God for the faithful around us, even when our faith is weak or when we bodily need help. Uh, I I can't help but glorify God for the church. My wife Diane and I have talked many times about we don't know how people get by in this world without the love and care of the body of Christ. I also don't know how sometimes we take it for granted so easily. I just want you to be encouraged. Think about how the church has loved you, served you, and continues to. Oh, I'm not saying it's perfect, but that's not my goal to convince you that the church is perfect. My goal is to get you to appreciate and be grateful for the things that God has built the church to do and that we still do for one another because of God living within us. So these people, they bring the paralyzed man before Jesus and Jesus gives an odd first declaration to the man. He says, your sins are forgiven. Something he didn't say to those who who were paralyzed. Something he didn't say to those who were cowering in the boat during the storm. But there was something in this man's life that sin was tied to to what had happened in his life, apparently, or sin was so present that it had to be dealt with. 
Jesus has the ability to triage our problems even when we don't. Do you, do you believe that? As a follower, since he's our shepherd, he actually knows the things we need to deal with first. Sometimes a good prayer is, Lord, help me to order my day according to your way. What are the things I most need to work on first? Because many times we can think the things that we see as a priority are God's priority. Jesus says to the man, your sins are forgiven. A second group now chimes in. The, the scribes, the keepers of the law, who begin to mutter to themselves, this is blasphemous. This is taking a role on man reserved only for God, forgiving sin. Jesus then, I think, is playing into who they are and how they behave. S sort of leading them down the path to say, well, which is easier, you, you religious guys? To say, you're forgiven, or to tell a crippled man to get up and walk. They must be thinking, well, you're right. It's a whole lot easier just to make a pronouncement about people's spiritual state. But Jesus takes it a step further to show the proof even of the great spiritual proclamation he had made, equating himself with the power of God to forgive sin. And he tells them, so, so that you can see the proof, so that word is married to work, so that wind is held in a shape that you can see is visible. Paralytic, get up and walk. Who now takes his bed and goes home. What a change in that person's life, from one who, who needed for a time to rely on others to bring him closer to Christ now can walk on his own. What's your story? How has Jesus spoken to you in a way that has changed who you are, where the course of your life is different because of the healing and direction and guidance he's given to you as the great shepherd? You see, life changes when we come to know Jesus. That, that hardened cynicism of a world that is so broken, we, we begin to have hope because we know there's another promise. We haven't seen it fully revealed yet, but God has promised for those who love and serve him the, the greater restoration. Not, not just the keyhole story of one or two. But if we look at these stories, we can see the whole picture. We can see one who can fix the natural world, one who can fix the spiritual world, and one who can fix the plight of an individual human and therefore all humanity. One who is king over creation. One who will end the terror of a broken world that we can't fix, a mess we can't clean up. One who, who can thwart the demonic, who would have us hate the image of God and we just continue to live in it almost out of habit at times. One who can heal us of our own sickness of body and of soul. Jesus, who forgives sins. The miracles of Matthew will continue in the gospel until we see that he raises the dead. This is the king being presented in full regal power. When you see this world, don't let cynicism become the story. When you see its tragedy, you know what sin looks like in your life and in the lives of all of us collectively. When you see evil beyond even our imagination, you know what evil looks like. When you see the world falling apart and we have no idea how to fix it, you understand what the course of sin looks like. But never stop that story there. If the story's just about us, it's, it's a story of ashes and dust. But when the story is Jesus' story, it becomes a narrative of endless glory. Press into your Lord, in all of your doubt, in all your fear, in all your confusion. He is the shepherd. He is the creator. He is the savior. He's the king. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful as your servants for all that you give us. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us to enjoy the things that are wondrous in your world and to weep over the injustices and to follow you in being ones who correct injustice, who, who bring healing, who bring righteousness. Father, we know that we will never fix all that's in this world, but we ask you to give us strength to continue to pursue what is right and good. Father, we ask that you'd give us faith and confidence to know you will one day make all things right. Father, we pray for the comfort of this world at this time where we've noticed more than usually how broken we are, how fragile we are, and how potentially deadly the world around us is. Lord, help us to lift our eyes and see what you've revealed. King Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we now pray. Amen. around.
surrounding me Let it break At your name Still Call the sea to still The rage in me to still Every way At your name Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble
One thing before announcements, Terra Nova, I, I hope many of you, if not all of you, got to see the Thursday update. Uh, I, I presented uh, after meeting with the elders and the coaches for tribes our plan for unpausing, reopening. It has to do with tribes. We're going to try to use the strength of us being a small group-based church to build again Terra Nova. Uh, right now, we're not going to be able to build the church in large gatherings for multiple reasons because Revolution Hall is being remodeled and because there's restrictions on how many people can meet in a clustered group. But we are going to gather our tribes live again. We want to use the summertime. A lot of times we would ask tribe leaders or encourage tribe leaders, take time off, take the summer off and give everyone a break and maybe get together socially once. Instead, we're asking people to use this time, to use our backyard space to be able to gather together at least twice a month and to be able to have tribes, the community of Terra Nova, meeting again together. If you have questions about that, you, you can email me. You can email troyquestions at terranovachurch.org. Uh, you can go online, please, and watch that Thursday update. Uh, it, it, you'll also be getting a survey. There was also a survey that was sent out uh, this, this Friday. You should be getting that if you're in a tribe. Uh, we, we want to be able to hear from you, the people of Terranova Church, on how we can best do this together. It's a lot. We're moving forward into a land we've never navigated before. This is my first time leading a church through a pandemic. How about you? Um, but thank you for your continued prayer and support at Terra. Uh, we're going to get through this under the Lord. He is our shepherd and we shall not want. Hello all. If you have made it this far, our truest hope is that during this time of hearing the word and responding in worship, is that Jesus was revealed to you. My name is Dennis Gardner. I'm Terra Troy's Operations Director. If this video is your introduction to our church and you want to know more about who we are and what we believe, please visit terranovachurch.org. And if you wanted to reach out to us directly, please feel free to email troyquestions at terranovachurch.org. Likewise, if you would like to give, tithe, or donate to Terra's primary mission, which is to make more and better disciples of Christ, there are various ways to do so. Links on how you can do that are in the description below. And as always, as we are obedient to God's call to give from that which he's given us, we encourage all to do so sacrificially, regularly, and joyfully. Last Sunday, we announced that as reopenings and unpausings in New York State have slowly started, the leadership of Terror wants to be mindful and careful and prayerful when taking steps toward reestablishing our corporate meetings. Pastor Ed spoke about this in depth in an update video posted this past Thursday. If you're watching this and have not already done so, 
please go to the link in the description below and watch that Thursday update video as soon as you're done watching this one. Pastor Ed speaks candidly and honestly and pastorally about the plans and strategy for Terra's future. It's important information. Uh, in it, he also talks about an online Google-based survey for those who are currently in one of our small groups, or as we call them, tribes. This is how the leadership is going to be able to get a gauge for how our congregation thinks and feels about the reopenings. Uh, if you're in a tribe, you should have already gotten that survey. We ask that you would please submit those individual questionnaires by this Tuesday night. This Tuesday night, June the 2nd. And please continue to pray for the elders as they navigate the weeks and the months ahead and that they would continue to present Christ through it all. Amen? Our benediction today will be given by another of our Troy deacons, Daryl Bush. Today's benediction is from Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great week, Terranova.